Welcome to the Talking Toughness series of podcasts, where we examine the mental toughness concept with guests from a wide range of sectors, illustrating that our mental approach to what happens to us and around us matters for all of us. Our guests come from the worlds of business and public service, education, social mobility, sport and health. They all share their experiences and their observations about the factors that have enabled them to survive and to thrive on their journey through life. Many guests have gone further and incorporated the concept into what they do as coaches, trainers, managers and leaders, helping others to thrive in their turn. Their experiences are valuable to those of us who strive to do the same. Our very special guest today is Andrew Stotter Brooks, known as Stotts to his friends and colleagues. We've got to know Andrew and his work at close quarters in recent years and have grown to admire a truly unique approach to people and organisational development. Andrew is Vice President of Learning and Development for Etihad Airways, where he leads the creation of innovative, and they are innovative, leading edge learning solutions to support the development, growth and performance of Etihad's almost 25,000 global team members. But there's more. Andrew is a reflective practitioner, very down to earth, very thoughtful about his work and his purpose, and very energetic in applying this. So it's not a surprise that in October 2022, he was nominated as number one in a list of 10 most influential HR leaders in the United Arab Emirates. Andrew has a special interest in leadership, which we will explore, and usefully has picked up on our work on mental toughness and incorporated this into his thinking and his work. So, welcome. Oh, where do I send the check? <laughs> 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 it's, it's a, do you know what, Doug? It's, we just, what, you're one of my heroes. We have this, you know, you know uh, we, we've had three um, fascinating conversations um, in our, we have a World Class Wednesday podcast. Um, for Etihad, and we still get many thousands of views um, of those podcasts with you. And it's um, it's just fantastic to be able to, to continue those conversations um, in this format. Yeah, so thank you for um, having me as your guest. Oh, it's, it really is a pleasure. Um, and perhaps we can start. It, it, uh, you've often spoken about leadership, and I think you've got some fascinating uh, views on leadership. Why have you got this interest in leadership? <laughs> I, I, I suppose it, for me, it's just about trying to help people. It's just trying to help people just be there, the, the best that they can possibly be. It's probably probably the simplest way of putting it. It's really, really interesting. I was, I was listening to a podcast actually by the Harvard Business Review um, at the weekend and the, the whole piece around being kind. Um, one, of my, one of my great heroes is a guy called Elton Mayo. And he, he obviously was very sort of like, um, you know, early in the discovering of what we call sort of, you know, emotional quotient, um, EI or EQ. And I suppose the, the really big kind of piece that I took away, definitely early part of my career, was the importance of keeping it human, keeping it kind, really caring about people. I think if we do that, it's, it's, it's just incredible um, the impact that has. And I think, you know, as I was, I was with our, our CEOs, obviously, um, the, the brilliant Tony Douglas is, is, is obviously just sort of checked out um, on Monday, yesterday um, for us. But, you know, the, the, our numbers speak for themselves. I mean, the, the idea that we could have, we, we're now such an incredibly profitable organisation because we're creating this, the sense of alignment, the sense of care, this real kind of like kindness and helping people to be the best they possibly can be. And help people, I suppose, play to their strengths. I think that's important as well. So the idea that we can put people in the right places and let them really kind of enjoy their work is is really critical. So yeah, so I suppose in one word, just just being kind. Mm. I, I I wonder then, Stotts, how does that um allowing people to or enabling and supporting people to be the best they can be? sounds fantastic so if I'm listening to that I'm then thinking okay like how do you do that like what, what what do you do to allow or support people to be the best they can they can be I think it's giving giving them a voice I think the more that we ask mm -hmm. questions and the more that we encourage them to feel comfortable asking questions and to challenge and to to you know to really be innovative I think you know sometimes we I think as leaders we have it's a bit of a, a bit of a curse, isn't it? We we have this experience ourselves, and we sometimes forget that as leaders, we 
we, we've made mistakes in the past. One of my, my favorite topics when I'm talking to leaders is that whole point around failing. I think sometimes when we're, we don't, we don't want our team to fail, we don't want our team to hurt themselves, but we also forget that when they are failing, um, they are learning as well. And so sometimes by just allowing them the space to to have that experience and actually to, to perhaps get it wrong and to learn from that experience is really important. It, it, it takes slightly longer. It's the easiest thing in the world for me to tell someone how to do something. But the reality is when we tell someone how to do something, there isn't really much learning going on. And I think I, I have two we were talking about your your children earlier, um, John. You're just a little bit. I'm a, I'm a bit ahead. My my children are in their sort of mid twenties now, and obviously they're probably part. You know, excluding my wife, which she obviously is very precious to me as well. But they're very very precious human beings to me, and the whole sense that we want them to to grow and learn and be successful humans within the um, the you know the the, the culture that they're living and um, wherever that might be. But it's really about allowing them to to do things their way and it's about allowing allowing humans to do things their own way allowing employees to do things their way even if we're not necessarily comfortable with that i have a duty of care towards my children i have a duty of care towards my my guests my my business and to my my employees but sometimes i don't know best and i think we it's a it's a it's a very very um interesting conversation it's allowing them to have a go and to practice and perhaps make mistakes mm. and learn from those mistakes. So yes, yeah, so, and, and letting them feel comfortable asking questions. I, I had a, there's a chap called Alan Layton. He was the, the chairman of um, Asda and Walmart, um, a very early part of my career. And he always talked, he always spoke about these kind of like these, maybe I'm sort of putting people in boxes, but I don't really want to, that's not really my intention here. But he would always say there is, there's three types of individual stance and there's the, when we're trying to do something there's obviously what we call our embracers and these people kind of really kind of just they just, they just love mm. it they're just you know wrapped down a drain pipe which is fantastic there's also this huge sort of body of people probably 65 70 percent of people who tend to just think that change is being done to them and they just they can't really do anything about it they can't really challenge it and then we have this probably the smaller group who are the kind of the, 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 the sort of the verbal kind of rejectors of everything. So really they and I think classically what, what managers tend to do, what leaders tend to do is almost ostracize the, the rejectors because we feel that they're just they're disruptive and they're not really helping us from a leadership perspective and they're getting in the way and they're just they're just difficult human beings. But my experience and definitely what Alan taught me many, many, many years ago was just actually let's listen to these people because sometimes they're they're able to verbalize what the majority are thinking. So actually just allowing people to have a voice and to kind of like raise their concerns, rightly or wrongly, um, it gives, gives you some clarity, you know, seeing things from different perspectives. So yeah, the more that you can do that and the more that you can have forums and you can listen to people and you can get people involved in projects. Um, we're, we're, we're doing a big piece at the moment around, you know, what we call success profiles and trying to explain, you know, what would make a particular role successful. And a big part of that is we've been doing some, we, we started with a, some hackathons and it sounds a bit crazy, but bringing lots and lots of team members into a room and actually getting them to be very creative about what they did for a job. And that's kind of morphed into this more kind of digital process now. So actually getting people to get involved in sharing what, who their connectors are, their stakeholders, what kind of experiences, qualifications, you know, maybe the attributes of a particular role, maybe how that kind of feeds into competencies and how they're growing and developing, maybe um, qualifications. This is really useful information because it then creates that alignment with the employee that everyone understands how they're basically working within the organization. And, 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 and we have these kind of six points with our OGSM, which are, our, you know, and it's, I suppose, my, a big part of my job is making sure that critically everyone is aligned to delivering those goals for the organization. You know, our big overall goal for the organization is, is bringing the world to Abu Dhabi in a sustainable way. So making sure people understand that, but then the specific actions that they're taking to do that, that, deliver that goal for the organization. And actually then how we develop the skills to help them to be successful delivering those goals for the organization, because that's where it's really at. So that complete alignment of what we're trying to do. Because if we have people in moving in different directions and not clear about what they're being asked to do, of course, they're, they're sort of pulling against each other. I'm, I'm doing a visual sort of like cue here, but so clearly this is um, video. You, you get my um, yeah. question, John. Yeah, and, and do you know what I really like about about that stops is that you, you you gave some specific examples there but at the start you kind of went straight to look it 
it starts by that kind of perspective that, that you mentioned duty of care you kind of made this inference that it's similar to sort of looking after your own children and stuff and I, I, I think it's really interesting that before you get into the uh, kind of what you do and how you do it that sort of overarching philosophy of caring for people and being kind um uh, sort of has to sit uh, sit front and center does does that sound right yeah john i mean I, 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 doug was was overly generous with his comments about this this thing in the ue recently and i think that's fascinating but what's fascinating for me about that whole piece is that i've had team members i'm i'm, I'm turning into an old man john and I, i've had team members from literally not wake, not making this up but 40 years ago who have kind of reached out to me and they remember me and it's really really i just find that staggering and i i say i've, I've told this story to a few people now and they say well why are you surprised that they remember you after 40 years and they remember me and they want to then sort of reach out and say well you just touched me andrew you know when you you worked with me when i was you know when you were a young man as a manager in your sort of early 20s and you actually i i have very very you know, you really touched me and you touched me because you were very caring, you were very kind, you were supportive, you were asking questions, you really kind of helped me in my career. And that was really fascinating for me, just just that they were kind of coming back to me 40 years later. Mm. And I I was chatting to our, our head of comms about this, this kind of phenomenon. And I wasn't, I'm not looking for, um, I'm, 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 I'm please not looking for any kind of praise or accolades here for this. But what was interesting when she then kind of like, you know, made a very interesting comment to me and that was people um never forget how you make them feel yeah. and i think sometimes if you if you genuinely take time with people we've had this conversation before and it's probably on it's probably actually on on my on my back kind of backdrop today and doug and i have spoken about this before but that, that sense where people need to be heard they need to be respected remembered and acknowledged and it's so so very simple if you do those things with people it makes a huge difference so just really but it's kindness I can't, mm. and the more human that we are, I've got a very good friend who um, who works with Harvard University, and he, um, he he's, he's an American chap, and he, and he and he won't mind me saying um, you know saying that he's he, he quite he is quite American in his mannerisms, <laughs> and he has a slightly um, interesting world view. Um, let's let's put it that way, uh, which is quite fascinating. When he's definitely working, doing some work with sort of Middle East, some of our Middle Eastern colleagues, there's obviously a massive culture clash, and one of the things that's often I find very amusing is that some of my my Emirati my beautiful Emirati friends and colleagues will kind of say you know you don't you don't understand our culture you don't understand yeah. us and it might work in you know in Boston it might work in Mystic but you don't really understand our culture it's not how it works and and whenever this happens I'm just I'm waiting for him to sort of explode because he does explode and eventually he sort of he, he he sort of takes it on board and he listens to them, which is really, really fascinating. And then he'll ask them some really kind of random question. It goes normally something like this. He, he'll look at them and he'll say, Have you got a spleen? Yeah. And it's um and I and I kind of go, Oh, here we go. Here we go. We're gonna get this interesting conversation now. And of course they look at him kind of confused and they go, Yeah, I I have a spleen. And they go, Well, have you got a heart? Yeah, I've got a heart, yeah. And if you got have you got like kidneys and a and a, and a, and a liver? Yeah, yeah, I have all those things. So I said, well, actually, we're we're ninety nine point nine 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 percent identical. Yeah, let's start focusing on that, and let's start focusing on the humanness about who we are, as opposed to that we have different kind of cultures or beliefs. Because actually, we're more alike than we're different, which I think is really fascinating. So I, I know it sounds really uh, sort of cliche and a bit sad, but the more that you focus on that genuine kindness, and it's you know. I, I, and, I, and I kind of said this a thousand times, and it's a coveyism, so I'm not going to sort of steal the words, but people do not care um, what you know until they know um, how much you care. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think that's really important. It's about those kind of those relationships and just allowing people to really sort of flourish, um, ask questions, feel very safe in what they're trying to do. It makes a big difference. It really does. And it takes a small investment. It's, uh, you know, just... The simplest things like saying good morning and, and saying things like, you know, what else do you need from me? Um, it makes a big difference. And unfortunately, there's no there's no quick way of doing that. You have to. One of the things that Tony said to me recently was it's, it, I'm, I'm completely staggered, Andrew, that, you know, so many people know who you are within the organization. How did how have you achieved that in your time with Etienne? And I said, Tony, honestly, 
if you want, and we did this on a podcast and with, with Tony when I was interviewing him a few weeks ago. And I said, well, honestly, Tony, it's because I, I say good morning and good evening and, and I smile and I wave to people in the office every day. Yeah, mm-hmm. not just when I'm feeling in a good mood every day. And that, that gets the relationship going, really. Yeah. Andrew, where did you learn that from? Because you know, I, we could talk to another person who wouldn't be. T- they, we talk these stories wouldn't emphasise the the power of kindness and care as much as you do. Were you, did you experience that at the I start of I, your I, career? I I said I, I think I've had some really, I had some really chronically bad managers, some really chronically bad yeah. managers. <laughs> so so I, I kind of I suppose I tried to. I, I think that's almost been some learning for me because I want to be the I want to be the leader that I would follow. I think that's 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 really 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 important. Yeah. And, and do you know what? I, I, this is going to sound really really corny, and I'm not sure whether we've discussed this before, Doug. And it's my I do I do. I kind of do a guest spot. We do all the, every induction we ever run. I do a kind of guest spot, and they and my team um, very beautifully invite me in. And I, it's been lovely recently because we've had so many alumni coming back into the organisation, and you know, so past past employees sort of like you know swimming back into the organisation. In itself, I mean, that's amazing. They want to come back into an organisation because they they love the organization so much and there's a, there's a lot of talk about the great come the great resignation people kind of like moving away and they would never want to go back to an old relationship but it's that's beautiful but i always tell the story what people always kind of stagger to understand about me so i say to them when when i'm work, working with them it was yesterday it was like 70 people on monday i was i was i was in abu dhabi yesterday and i was we obviously did the induction and that was only 15 minutes but i said you never guess where i started my career my career started washing dishes in a big hotel that's that mm-hmm. And this is going to sound as corny as anything, but my kind of at the beginning of my my career, it was always the first day. It was I just want to be a really good washer up. I just want to try to be as good as I can possibly be in that washing up. And there's a woman called Yvonne Johnson. She passed away now, unfortunately, but she was a she was the general manager of the hotel. I really had no idea who this woman was. I was a very young man at the time, and she was walking past my um, dishwash area, and she she was kind of walking past. She wasn't really present. I think that's probably the word. She wasn't present. She was walking past. And then suddenly she, she abruptly stopped. And she said to me, oh, my gosh, we have never had a dishwasher like you. This is amazing. We've never seen this area. This whole part of the hotel has never looked like this. What? Wow. And I was like, I was like, OK, well, you, you, uh, thank you for that. And then she then. You know, sort of waved her magic wand and um, and made me the I was the dizzy height of being a waiter. And probably the most important lesson I ever learned was on my second day of employment um, in my career, which was and, the, and, and anyone who's listening to this would know the answer to this question. But if you're a waiter, there's a very interesting dynamic that kind of goes on. And I can always I, I, I'm very privileged. I go out to dinner quite a lot and it always and I go to some very nice restaurants, but it always staggers me the the, the, the level of service you do or don't get. And because mm-hmm. actually there's a very, very real transaction between the, the level of service you receive and the amount of money you're prepared to give the server. Right. It's called a gratuity or a tip. Right. So, if, you know, if, I actually kind of learned very quickly that when I was earning only four pounds a week. <laughs> you know, we're talking it's a long time ago. Right. So I was earning four pounds a week to be a waiter. But I could easily clear a hundred pounds a week in gratuities. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> so because what I was able to do, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making it up, you know, what I was what I was able to do is actually give people what mm. they need. And when people ask me that question, I will say to them that quite honestly, if you give people what they need, you can pretty much write your own check. And it doesn't matter if you're talking to the CEO, the chairman, the, the general manager, the director, give them what they need, understand what they need, and then you basically give it to them. That's 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 a big secret, really. Yeah. I, I just love this um, this focus on care, attention, paying paying attention to other people. I'm a very similar uh, experience. In, in my twenties, I went to work for the Wedgwood Group. The Wedgwood Group had twenty companies in a group, and one of them was Coalport China, and it outperformed the other nineteen or twenty by something like fifteen percent. And they had a chief executive who was totally different to all the other chief execs. And I was able to work with him for about eight months. On my first day, I spent three to four hours of that day just walking around his operation with him. Now, it's not Etihad size, but it's still big, about 1,100 employees. 
And I watched him do this day after day. And each day he'd walk into a department and he'd find somebody whose daughter had had, had a baby or something like that. And he would say, take a couple of hours off. Visiting's two till four. Go and go and see them. We'll pay you. And he, he made these little gestures. And I asked him one day, I said, look, I, I don't quite understand this. I think a, a chief executive is somebody who sits, does strategic planning, you know, very often he's in lots of meetings. You spending all your time out with your workforce. And his answer to me was, well, I want them to care about what matters to me. How can I do that if I don't care about them? Yeah. And to this day, that has been, it's been kind of a, a guiding message for me, you know? So to hear you talk in exactly the same vein, um, it's, it, 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 do you know what? It's always the big challenge I've always had when I've been sort of running sort of multiple units, and we've been, you know, in, in my, I've been very privileged in my career to be to be fair. And I, but always, I, I obviously hear a lot of managers saying, you know, we're really really busy, and then it's the end of the shift, and people are just leaving. And I say, well, that's actually, hmm, that's interesting because in my experience, there's and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm massively oversimplify leadership here, but there's the, in my mind, there's, there's kind of two leaders. There's the there's a leader who genuinely cares. And there's just a leader who just is just trying to use people. But when the when the kind of the crap hits the proverbial fan, right, and it's all kind of going Pete Tong. It, honestly, if the, if the manager is just there's a perception that manager just uses you, and, and, I, and I know there's no value to you, and there's no relationship there between you and the manager. Honestly, the the employees will go home. They will just leave you. In my experience yeah. of this style of leadership, and I make more mistakes than pretty much everyone made. You know, come together. And, and it's also a major benefit of that because everyone always wants to help me. They always want to pile in the help because we, we because we, I, you know, I rightly or wrongly, it's we care. So when something happens, people don't stand there and go, "Ha, huh, he's done it again." Everyone seems to just want to come and help, right? And that's and that's that kind of collectiveness about just because if you look after them, they tend to look after you. It's it's yeah. it's, it's really really weird. I used to have this um. I, I, well, I worked in a big, very, very busy restaurant in in, in, in central London. We used to serve, you know, ten thousand plus meals a day. And again, it's back to my my dear friends on the dishwash. And we had a, they, they, it was a, we were talking, you know, if you're if you're serving ten thousand meals a day, you that's a lot of that's a lot of crockery and cutlery, right? It needs to be washed up. Yeah. And we used to have a big, I mean, like an enormous um, dishwash area that took seven full time team members to actually to main, maintain the the level of kind of like um, crockery required to service the, the restaurant and well I had a, 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 a you know back of house manager who was just abhorrent his behavior was disgusting the way he used to treat people was absolutely awful he was very efficient he was really hard working but he was just disrespectful of people and on one particular occasion there had been a bit of a, a you know a bit of argy-bargy in the kitchen because it's a high pressure environment if you're serving 10,000 meals a lot of it's a very high pressure environment and this individual thought it was really funny to put a, um, a piece of crockery under a heat lamp and then he passed it through it was, it was yeah. open open kitchen to the restaurant so you know, as a diner you could sort of see into the restaurant you could see into the kitchen um so i said very busy restaurant very busy kitchen and a whole show go, kind of going on back of house which diners could see and he basically placed this um he heated up this this piece of crockery and passed it through into the dishwash area and of course, the poor dishwash person had sort of picked up this bit of crockery up, you know, blindly and had quite nastily burnt themselves. And of course, his reaction was then to throw this bit of crockery back at the manager. And mm. the manager then picked it up and sort of threw it back into the wash up area. And, and then, or at that, that point, they, they, they stopped working. So the seven guys who were working with dishwash stopped working and um, just walked off the line. And I didn't realize what was happening until we started getting tickets going along. And I went to the kitchen. And I, I remember saying to this this manager, "What's happened?" And he said, "Oh, the and he was using he used very derogatory language, which I won't repeat here. Incredibly derogatory to describe the individuals who are working in the in the wash up area." And I said, "That's just completely inappropriate." And I said to him, and "I said, look, okay, let's just we need to move on. I need to get these people back in the." So I went downstairs and I spoke to them, and we knew that the um this, these guys were one of the sort of the, the, the most influential um, dishwashers. Was fascinated by um, by ducks. Sounds really crazy. Um, he used to he used to breed ducks, exotic ducks, and I knew this bit of information about him. And we always were talking about his ducks. 
you know that was that was a good point of conversation so when i started the conversation we've got a massively busy restaurant upstairs but let's 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 start talking about his ducks let's have that conversation how are your ducks what are you doing you know and then then he said look i understand but what that behavior was really bad and that's why we reacted i said okay that's, we'll, we'll have this conversation after the shift would you just on a you know do me a favor and come back up but yes of course for you would do anything andrew it's fine and they returned but that's because you have that relationship with people right mm. you know that's a long story i apologize you, yeah but it's, it's uh, but it makes a point though it's about caring for people yeah. no, I, 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 fully enough and i, I don't mention names but um in the same group we found exactly the same horrible manager who would walk around he'd pick up a plate and they would inspect plates because of the, uh, the sort of china that they were making was very expensive and he'd throw it on the floor and smash it and he would just say that wasn't good enough and he'd walk away and he'd leave people in tears and he thought he was somehow well not motivating them but terrifying them into into working harder he was doing the complete opposite so completely <laughs> you and i have had parallel experiences i think yeah it was it was weird because i was chatting i was chatting to the chairman of the cipd um a few weeks ago he was a very interesting man actually and he was it wasn't a podcast it was just a cup of coffee but he was saying he was he, he sort of pointed me in the direction of alex ferguson and he was he, and there's a there's a i don't know if you've seen it but there's a really interesting um documentary about alex ferguson becoming sick and then obviously his memory yeah, yeah. and stuff and there's a really kind of like poignant part there where he's asked to describe um, leadership and he pauses and then he, and then that's, I think that's really, really, I've, I've, I'm trying to, I've been trying to unpick it ever since I watched Alex Ferguson say it. And he's, and he's trying to define leadership and he says leadership for him anyway, is this piece, but he's somewhere between sort of like fear and respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's really, and, I, and it, it doesn't sit comfortably with me, if I'm honest. You know, I don't think the I don't think employees should be or team members should be scared of you. You know, they should respect you. And yeah. I worked in the Merchant Navy. You know, you you know, I worked in the Merchant Navy for a while. And one of the things that really kind of used to wind me up about the Merchant Navy um, was the fact that, and it's a very worn phrase. People used to say to me, "Well, they need to earn their stripes, stops. You know, they need to earn their stripes. Mm. I'm not going to respect that person until he earns, you know, until she earns her stripes or until he earns her stripes." And I used to say to them, "That is just so wrong." You know, why do they need to earn your, why do they need to earn their stripes? Given that, I mean, they can lose them. They can lose your respect, 100%. People can lose my respect, Doug. Don't get me wrong. I mean, and people do lose my respect. But I give them my respect freely at the beginning. Yeah. Do you think that might have been a, a poor piece of language? Because I can imagine uh, leadership being about helping people with challenges. And for a lot of people, facing a challenge in, introduces a sense of fear. Yeah. because it's un unknown but i would say helping somebody to stretch themselves is a key aspect of leadership so i could i could explain what ferguson says i'm not sure that's what he meant but if i had to explain it somehow i think I, that's how i would do it 